Okay, good afternoon. Um, this is um, a striker symposium. Um, we've got three speakers. Um, we're going to start by myself and then Jean-Christophe Gendric. And hopefully, uh, Vitor will finish the case by then and he can uh, join us. So we're trying to manage the time. So Victor will be, will be last. Um, so with uh, the Evolve uh, Flow Diverter, um, these are my disclosures. Um, it's, a, it's a journey that, uh, uh, that the surpass has been having with, uh, you're probably all familiar with uh, the previous uh, iteration of the, um, uh, the surpass. Um, the current one is the uh, culmination of a lot of work and research done by, by the company and the engineers. And it's more or less uh, similar in terms of the degree of flow diversion and the poor density and porosity to the streamline system, which some of you might be uh, familiar with. Um, the mesh density um, is more or less comparable to the previous one. The difference is the shape of the pores, um, as you can see from this diagram. Um, um, the uh, difference uh, is in shape rather than in size. In terms of the flow diverting effect, if you believe in CFD, it's more or less similar to the streamline. Um, and the design difference is that the current um, Sebas Evolve um, has more of a braid angle, which allows it to have more ability to open up better and also it gives it more radial force as well, so it, uh, it opposes the wall uh, better than um, uh, uh, the, the streamline in a way. Radial pressure is, is pretty good. Um, it's two and a half uh, percent, uh, two and a half times uh, higher than uh, BD. Um, and it's available in several uh, sizes, as you, you might be aware of, it starts from the 2.5 up to 5 millimeters, and you, you'll be able to cover a vessel of up to 5.2 in diameter, and the length you can get up to 40 uh, in length um, with the larger diameters. Um, in our department, we uh, use <coughs> the surpass, we've been using it since the beginning or early on in 2019. And this is the database we have for all of our cases. As you can see, we've done here about uh, 40, um, 46 cases, of which we have 25 patients with follow-up. And I think the follow-up is, is uh, um, important because it does show that the device is more or less uh, similar in terms of the flow diverting effect, although these design differences to the, to the previous iteration. Um, there are uh, um, several information available on this here, but uh, um, I'll go through some of these cases and we will highlight some of the issues. In terms of outcomes from our patients, we have no acute and stent thrombosis, so it's been, so far it's been pretty reliable. One patient had asymptomatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, for which we just managed the antiplatelet treatment um, for several days, and then we uh, put the patient back on antiplatelets. No clinical stroke observed, although two patients had a couple of uh, diffusion-weighted hits on their MR imaging. 25 patients so far had follow-up, and we had 19 patients with complete occlusion, about 76%, which is comparable to uh, what's available on the market. Two asymptomatic instant stenosis. I'll share some of these images with you. We always use a triaxial system with the infinity. Obviously, that is important. Uh, the XT27 is being used regularly with this device. Radial um, uh, access is also has been used for some of these cases. Uh, balloon, we, we're liberal in terms of using the balloon if we need to, but uh, as we said this morning, uh, we, we don't balloon just for the sake of it. I mean, unless there is a space between the balloon and the vessel, we don't tend to just balloon uh, these patients. This is uh, one of the cases we did. You can see uh, the, the small recurrence there from previous web, but there's also a small aneurysm here. 
both of them covered by the device, um, eight French Infinity Sheet, five French Cat, XT27, and a four by seven device has been used. And you can see here the deployment of the device and the visibility is, is very good. Uh, this is on the old Siemens machine. You can see that it's uh, uh, quite reasonably visible. Dyna CT done and uh, a full opposition. This is a follow up. The aneurysm has disappeared. The other one, you can see a line of intimal growth between the, the, uh, the, the PCOM and, and the neck that remained open because of the PCOM. Um, uh, this patient, acute hydrocephalus, following a large uh, recurrence of previously coiled ACOM. There is an azygous um, artery there, you can see. And there is a wide neck aneurysm which we coiled um, acutely. And this is the uh, one year follow up with a very large recurrence and the coils completely smashed. And this patient presented with hydrocephalus at this stage, so she had a shunt. And then we decided to divert as well as coil in order to prevent any recurrence. And this is the flow diversion, first stent. Notice it's somewhere here. Uh, but um, as we deployed, it dropped back down and um, we had no issue going back again. Now it's dropped, so it's in the neck and we have to go back up and deploy a second stent and then coil, as you can see here, um, uh, fully coil it and tightly coil it. And then the follow-up shows uh, complete uh, occlusion um, at six months as well. This is a lateral view. And this is the MR showing uh, uh, a complete occlusion with no uh, much in the way of edema, although that was, um, that was a, a, a T1 weighted. So this is the second patient I'm gonna share with you, which is a P23 aneurysm. Um, presented acutely with headaches. We were worried that it may rupture. Uh, I don't think there's this good surgical option here that perhaps you could argue you can occlude the aneurysm and the vessel. But we decided to uh, flow divert gel microcatheter, um, as you can see here. And then this is the device deployed. Uh, there is slight narrowing of the device here because of the vessel narrowing just before the aneurysm neck. Uh, once that's been done, and the device was deployed before the uh, basilar top as well, uh, coiling was performed, and this is the outcome with stability at six months as well. Um, this is the three, and uh, that's post-treatment. You can see reduction in the mass effect that this aneurysm has caused. Um, and this is the uh, six-month follow-up. Uh, another uh, case where we jail the microcatheter and coil. We tend to coil all the aneurysms that are 15 millimeters or higher to prevent any delayed hemorrhagic problems. And that seems to have served us very well. We've had no uh, hemorrhages from fluid diversion for, for a long time. So that is our practice. And you can see here the six month follow up, uh, the aneurysm remains completely occluded and the vessel seems to be patent with no problem. This is a, a further uh, case that required for the treatment of uh, an adjacent small aneurysm. The deployment, you can see, is fairly straightforward. You don't need to manipulate too much, so you just release the stent and it tends to open itself fairly freely. Um, and uh, sometimes, as I said earlier, we, we tend to uh, balloon angioplasty, which we did, I think, in this case, as you can see here. Um, and that has uh, a good follow-up with no uh, recurrence. And this is the uh, follow-up here. You can see the tiny filling at the neck of the uh, aneurysm to allow the vessel to remain patent rather than uh, anything else. This is one of the cases where we had instant stenosis. And uh, this is the follow-up. The aneurysm obviously has disappeared, but there is some instant stenosis. The way we deal with this, we keep the patient on dual antiplatelet for longer, 
and they tend to have a, a good outcome. And we will uh, see what happened to this patient. This is partially thrombosed aneurysm with a similar scenario and, and good uh, occlusion. PCOM before and after. So it's, it's, it's slight narrowing there, as you might see. You can see the arrow. Uh, slight uh, instant stenosis, but otherwise uh, no problems at all. Uh, this old lady is giving us problems. Previous stenting or for that version still come back, as you can see. So we, we deployed the surplus evolve inside the previous uh, stent. And uh, you can see the deployment, very easy, straightforward. You don't struggle with the opening of the Evolve usually. Uh, you can recanalize very easily as well. Unfortunately, this is one of the cases where there is no um, uh, cure. She's had further recurrence of the aneurysm and mass effect. We ended up occluding that uh, uh, vertebral artery at the end of uh, the treatment. And the last case is this one where we had uh, previous treatment with pipeline and coiling and also occlusion of one of the vertebral arteries um, with the recurrence at uh, two years still filling, as you may have spotted there. So we, we ended up deploying further stent inside, uh, um, inside the previous pipeline construct. And we're hoping that will have a good, um, good flow diverting effect um, uh, on follow-up, which will be probably sometime early next year. So in conclusion, um, the Evolve has a much easier trackability, and that's the main advantage, really. It's, it tracks very well in tortuous anatomy, and it does reliably open uh, distally and proximally. Uh, therefore, there is less need for distal you know, the drop and drag technique. Uh, we don't do that with, with the Surpass Evolve. Uh, good wall opposition, good visibility. I think with the limited number of cases, we had no major clinical sequelae so far. Uh, Follow-ups are very encouraging as well. So, so I, overall, we have a very favorable experience with the device. And that will be at the end of my talk. Um, I'm gonna now uh, are there any questions for uh, Sal? Please, Orlando. A microphone for Orlando. Yeah, no, no, we need a microphone, guy. It's coming on the right. I have two questions. One related to the flow diverters in general. When do you decide to put to place coils in an aneurysm, and why? And the second is uh, re uh, regarding to the evolve. What percentage of the cases you do angioplasty that is not opening, especially at the proximal aspect? Um, we coil any large aneurysm, uh, especially intra-dural uh, ones. Uh, so anything 15 millimeters or above. I mean, it's not like a cutoff line, but uh, usually around the 15 millimeter, we tend to coil. If you look at the previous studies, there is very few that has rupture with the small. Majority of ruptures are for large aneurysms. So that's what we do. We coil the big ones. Um, in terms of um, the, um, what was the second question, sorry? Percentage of angioplasties. Yes, percentage of angioplasties. Well, I don't, I don't have a percentage, Orlando, but I think I would probably say a handful of cases has angioplasty, very few uh, that we, we angioplasty in, in the Evolve. It does tend to open really well, so let's see. So, uh, Sal, we have uh, Victor available. Is it okay for you that we switch to Vitor? Yeah, um, okay. so, so Vitor is going to talk about the global um, Evolve experience, um, and also he will allude to some remote proctoring as well, hopefully. So, over to you, Vitor. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. We just finished the case. Uh, we will show. We will show the images uh, uh, shortly. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, talk about our experience with uh, Evolve. Uh, these are my disclosures, and thanks, Stryker, for the invitation and the collaboration. And this collaboration started uh, at the stages of uh, development. Was we had uh, a lot of uh, uh, learnings and fun 
while uh, helping the development of the device with the engineers. They had many trips to our lab and we tested the different interactions until get to the stage that we are here. And uh, a couple of these pictures with AJ that came for our first week of cases in May 2018 actually demonstrate the beginning of a journey that uh, has come uh, very successfully, uh, very far along. And that uh, we did uh, our, uh, the first cases uh, and, uh, of Evolve in patients. And, and over a week, we had uh, uh, a couple of sets of eyes from Alex Kuhn and AJ Waklu working with us uh, here in, in Toronto. And this is one of the cases that we have selected to start this experience because uh, during the, the, the experimental phase when we were evaluating and, and, and testing the device and models, we realized that uh, compared to other uh, self-expandable flow diverters, the Evolve had a fast opening and we could place uh, the device uh, very precisely regarding the distal end of the stand. So this is a 72-year-old that was part of our initial experience with pretty tortuous anatomy, uh, with a, a pecan uh, carotid segment uh, aneurysm. And, uh, and uh, we, we had planned to precise place a device below the bifurcation. You can place in the MCA as well in cases, but we had Despite of having a very short landing zone, we thought that we would be confident using an Evolve because of its, its fast opening. So this is the working projection that, is, that we had planned. We have seen that sometimes when you cover systematically big vessels like the ACA, you may have uh, some uh, uh, stenosis in the long term. This is why we try to be precise if we can. And this is the working projection to uh, control the proximal landing zone. And uh, this is the video of the initial deployment. Uh, despite of having a good control, we didn't manage the slack on the proximal curves. Uh, we didn't want to move the CAT5 forward. Probably if we had, we would have been more stable. But uh, another advantage of the device is the possibility to resheave and to reposition as we just did here. And then we moved a little bit forward it, uh, it covers the distal marker pretty well. There's no bumps. And we actually were able to place, expand the device at the level of the anterior choroidal and deploy the device along with a very nice position as the, the expert CT is demonstrating. Initial good flow diversion and six month follow up showing already complete occlusion. We do follow ups with MRI uh, with contrast. And that is a small artifact but it's a little bit bigger compared to uh, night nose stents, but we can still see the instant zone. So uh, we are pretty happy with results and we can see and we can demonstrate the aneurysm occlusion. So this is another case, uh, paraophthalmic aneurysm in a 45 year old male patient. Uh, this, this is a case that sometimes we may, may see uh, we, we may change the deployment technique a little bit. So, uh, we had a good distal and good proximal landing zone. We have the interest to try to place the device at the mid portion of the cavernous segment. Uh, we don't need to try to be short and actually having the device landing the curves because uh, the braids will need uh, some length to actually overcome the curve and find a good opposition. So for a case like that, we can start as distal as we can, but proximally we have to try to land the device in the mid uh, straight segment, a good centimeter away from a curve. So the, these are images from the procedure. So we have chosen a five by 20, uh, five millimeters because that was the size of the proximal uh, landing zone and 20 millimeters to make sure that we would go over the curve and have enough length. So as you can see here, uh, despite of the curve, we had the stent opened and we actually moved the microcatheter and pushed the stent to actually reach this uh, opening, optimal opening as, as we, we would like to see. And this is the vaso CT showing and despite the discrepancy of diameters between the distal and the proximal landing zones, we have an opposition of the stent all along this geometry. So I, I think this is, this is a stent that 
uh, is behaves very well uh, in this in this area, and this this is uh, one of the stents of choice that we use to treat uh, uh, aneurysms uh, at that location. And important uh, is that uh, the braiding angle has evolved also with the new generation of the Evolve making the expansion and the apposition of the device way better than other devices or uh, than the previous generation of the Surpass. And this is the follow-up uh, showing that if you have a good position, most of these paraclinoids aneurysms will be uh, completely occluded at six months. So uh, on this uh, development phase, we also evaluated the flow diversion of the Evolve and we have compared in an experimental setup using optical flow imaging, which is a method that Philips developed. So we helped them on the research side developing this technology as well, using 60 frames per second and actually comparing the intraneurysmal flow uh, compensated by the arterial flow before and after stent deployment. And you get a gradient, uh, uh, an index and actually uh, is correlated with aneurysm occlusion. And we use it in an experimental setup to compare a 48 wire, that is a pipeline with the Evolve. And we actually found a significant difference between the mean values of the MAFA, demonstrating that the braiding angles and the 64 wires does influence, uh, it does improve flow diversion and does influence in the intraneurysm flow, at least on the experimental setup. So, uh, we started uh, then, uh, since 2019, launching or helping the launch of this device uh, uh, all over the world, in North America, in Europe. Uh, and uh, we had COVID uh, last year. And uh, uh, we have been uh, helping uh, and a lot of uh, uh, sites uh, all over the world using the SKU Assist. This is uh, the SKU Assist uh, in one of our rooms. And we have the, the Proctor kit, and we connect it to different sites all over the world. This is one of the colleagues in Brazil, uh, Marco Turo, that is actually there uh, preparing a procedure. And we actually were able to uh, uh, help and proctor uh, and support the launch of Evolve uh, in, in different countries from Australia to Brazil. This is just the list of, of sites since March that we, we supported and helped uh, different procedures, uh, 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 fortunately, all very successful also because of the level of operators that we have over there. And uh, this is also, uh, uh, it's very comfortable uh, to actually uh, proctor uh, a procedure using Evolve, uh, even uh, if uh, remotely, because it's a device that you can, you can reliably uh, uh, understand and predict the next steps. You can, uh, I, I have a technique of deployment that work in most of the cases. And then if you need to variate, it's uh, in very few cases, depending on the anatomy of the, of, of the patient. And I'm very comfortable remote proctoring Evolve because of its, its consistencies its, and reliability. So we have reported with the team uh, of Gold Coast in Australia, Hall, Rice, and Leticia. Our first experience with Surpass Evolve was 25 cases uh, between us two. And I think at that time, only Saul had done also cases. And uh, we unfortunately didn't have his cases here. But we actually reported the very early uh, complication rates uh, with Evolve. We have a follow-up publication being prepared, including more centers. Uh, with uh, one year follow-up. And we had uh, all cases deployed with XT27 and 29 stents in 27 patients. And we, we observed uh, minor complications uh, that were completely reversible in three patients. And we observed one major complication on a patient that had an unexpected occlusion uh, of the stent that was well deployed and well placed, probably uh, condition uh, related or an anti-aggregation condition that we it was uh, unknown at that time. So all patients had a good follow-up and end up with an MRS uh, 0 to 2 and we had no mortality and we had one severe complication. To date, there are other publications with uh, Evolve. There are uh, uh, 
publications uh, with a midterm, six month follow up, our initial experience and other initial experiences with other centers, demonstrating occlusion rates varying from 71 to 86 percent, and the morbidity. Uh, mortality from 2 to 12 percent. This is uh, ours and, uh, and most of them were uh, uh, completely reversible. Um, and we have also experienced that even large sizes and large aneurysms, the device is consistent. This is a, a patient with 66 year old with cranial nerve compression that we actually treated with uh, an Evolve 5 by 40 and you will see that consistently you can deploy and oppose the device independent of the different uh, diameters of the arteries. And as you can see here on the VASO CT, it does follow very well the anatomy of the patient and does open uh, in different uh, geometries and diameters and even in long sizes. So this is a month follow-up demonstrating already a complete occlusion for a large aneurysm like that. It's, uh, uh, we don't see that fast occlusion, but this was a partially thrombosed aneurysm that just continued to progress. The, the occlusion of the aneurysm and was facilitated by the flow diverter. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure to be involved in the collection of prospective data with uh, I'm the co-PI of the Evolve trial with Adam Arthur. And we have a, a brilliant uh, steering committee team that we meet regularly to deal uh, with the, 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 the enrollment and, uh, and, and to monitor the actions of the different sites. We are doing pretty well, and the aim of the Evolve trial is to recruit unruptured wide neck intracranial aneurysms less than 12 millimeters in the carotid and its branches, including distal cases uh, on, on non bifurcating aneurysms. So, we are looking forward to have this trial completed and actually to have uh, prospective data uh, to. to to demonstrate to you in the future. Other uh, prospective studies underway, the Impact Registry uh, Evolve EU, Impact Registry Evolve France, Genese uh, Spanish Registry. They are all prospective studies monitored by Schult, Kucha from Zurich, uh, Jean-Christophe Gentric in, French and, uh, in France, and Juan Macho in, in Spain. So I would like to thank Stryker for uh, the successful launch and for involving us in many different activities and also on building on the building up of the clinical data and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you, Vitor. Um, any questions for Vitor? So just, uh, I know everybody knows uh, the quality of the presentation from Victor, so it's still uh, very nice. I'm amazed by the quality of the transmission as well. So it's yes. not a conventional zoom, as you can appreciate. Very stable. You have a very good uh, sound, stable, nice picture of Victor. It looks like uh, professional because it is just professional uh, uh, transmission. Okay. Thank you, Victor. It's wonderful. Yeah. Our uh, next speaker is Jean-Christophe Gentric uh, from um, the University of Brest uh, is going to talk to us about the skill assist and his experience with the skill assist. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure for me to talk today about this topic, about remote proctoring, and I will present you the two solutions I have experience with, the skill assist system for Striker and the Lumis from Antradis. Uh, um, my conflict of interest and personally what, what I think we no one know really the way we will work tomorrow and in-person interaction are and will remain necessary for training. Remote proctoring to my opinion can help in many situations and have advantages. I'm 40 years old and quite concerned that the way we, were, we are going to work in the near future. So. When you look on PubMed, it's quite a trendy topic, boosted by the COVID crisis. Um, you have 89 publications, but most of them for the last two years. And you have very recent publications in the INR field. You can see uh, this kind of publication during this summer. So if you want to read it, it's a little bit long, but it's about proctoring for uh, procedures, demonstration of concept using optical see-through head-mounted display, interactive mixed reality and virtual space sharing in the COVID-19 pandemic. 
you have this article and you have another one about augmented reality enhanced teleproctoring platform uh, to support a neuroendovascular surgery fellow. And I want to go through this, this presentation just to give you maybe a concrete idea of what's behind all these words. Uh, for the general presentation, it's quite easy to understand. You have on one side the patient and the physician, and on the other side the proctor, and uh, you have many means, headset or cameras, and you are able to follow the case uh, using a laptop of a workstation, and you have advantages, ecologic footprint for sure, probably the time, the money, and the ability to continue to collaborate despite the context. Um, I Okay. Um, uh, how does it work? Um, it is based on cloud bilateral exchange using a secure 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi unblockable connection with total encryption of the data. It is GPDR approved and HIPAA compliant. You have multiple systems. I do not know all of them. Um, but by the, by the way, you have the physician side and you have videos from a fixed camera, pan tilt zoom camera, glasses. You have also solution for the audio, the glasses, the headset, the microphone. And on the other side, uh, you have a proctor platform and we will see um, the details. Uh, for the advantages, uh, for example, with the skill assist Program. I said Vitor just have a word at the end of this talk. Uh, within six months, it is about 80 proctor case and customer VOC. It is 1.2 million miles saved and it is um, represent uh, 40 world tours. Uh, of course, you saved your time. Uh, it's quite uh, complicated sometimes to find the day for proctoring the cases, and you can add a proctor case in your daily schedule. Of course, you save money, and maybe the most important is that you are able to continue to collaborate um, despite the, the restriction, and you can see the US regulation for the COVID crisis, and in case of before, uh, we, it was mandatory uh, direct supervision. They allowed for new procedure and new uh, device, uh, real-time interactive audio and video technology to be used. So the potential application, uh, just a quick list of peer-to-peer -peer communication can be a long proctoring, quite um, classical one, but also emergency calls, fast calls. You can do live or record cases, training of non-medical people. Um, it can be useful in new indication, new device, and you can also use it in clinical trials. And I, I, will, uh, I will show you. So just one quick, um, probably you ever use uh, the, the skill assist system, but you have two cameras, one uh, is filming uh, your hand, the other one is filming the screen, and you have so have the, the ability to communicate with the proctor using a noise cancellation Bluetooth headset with a 10 hours built-in battery. And on the other side, the proctor will use one all-in-one monitor to display the live feed, and it appears on another um, screen that you have to add um, in your angel room, as you can see here. The proctor is also able to draw to point some um, specific uh, key um, of, the, of the procedure or of the anatomy, and you are able to see um, the, the drawing and the pointing uh, from, the, from the proctor in this um, same screen. So you, here, you just have a short video without the sound. So you can see here the proctor view on the, on the right side is able to see the screen, to, to uh, zoom on the screen and um, to, to, to follow the procedure. And at the bottom, you can also see uh, the monitor um, that the, the physician can, can use to, to see uh, what uh, the, the proctor can write on draw on his screen. Um, the proctor received two cameras in real time. So the one for the imaging and the one for the hands, and have the control on both of the camera and you can remotely move them to have a better view and to, to focus on one point. He also have the possibility to point uh, on, on the screen. And for example, here it is the placement of a flow diverter. It just um, points the, the landing zone and after it discuss with the, the physician to be sure that everything is fine and, and the, the procedure can end. Um, we try uh, our very first time was a, a collaboration with the R&D uh, from new um, intracellular and flow diverter uh, devices, the intracellular, the Trenza intracellular from Stryker and the Street study, and the Evolve flow diverter in the impact study, as, as just uh, 
Victor mentioned. So uh, we work here in Brest, uh, the engineers are in Fremont. So um, the, the, the kind of thing we've done before the procedure, we use 3D model specific of the patient and we talk with the RLD about the strategy, the sizing, the device, and we were exchanged before uh, performing um, the uh, real uh, procedure the, the day after, uh, as you can see. And here in videos, you have the, the placement of the, this intrasacular device in a, sorry, not so clear MCA aneurysm. And you can see here with the arrows, the headset, and um, the, the fixed camera uh, filming the screen. And uh, we were talking about sizing and uh, the way we have to place the mesh at the, at the neck of, uh, of this aneurysm, as you can see. I will present another solution. Um, we work, uh, it's, it is actually a work in progress solution powered by Antradis um, in France. Um, the concept is quite not the same. It is all-in-one all in your glasses using the HoloLens from Microsoft and using also a laptop in the Angerie for the calculation and cloning. So you have all you need in the glasses, the audio, the video, and the ability to grab and to, to uh, examine uh, holograms. I, I, I will show you using the, the videos. And on the other side, using the same uh, 4G, 5G, or Wi-Fi uh, cloud-based exchange, uh, you have um, a proctor art interface. So we create, in fact, a, a virtual cockpit, a bubble, um, designed for physicians, and it will evolve. We let room for future new tools. Uh, the tools will be developed in a second time and armed in the headset. The goal is to, and the long-term objective is to have a, a patient-specific real-time help. So you have, of course, the audio, the video, a, a chat, and a cloning of the large display. And you can see here the first videos. Um, so when you film an hologram, it is not so clear. Um, but if you try the headset and you have to try, you will see it's quite crystal clear. You can see here the window with the proctor with the chat uh, on the right, and you are able to, to place it anywhere in the room. For example, here it is specific images chosen by the proctor to help during the procedure. After, you have also the 3D. You can see here you have to grab it and to put uh, at one place um, in the Angel Suite, and, um, and you have the ability to manipulate all this, uh, these holograms, in fact. Concerning the, the 3D, you can make it quite big to, to improve the visualization, and you can um, uh, rotate and point some, uh, some uh, localization and to talk with, uh, with about. And you can see here the ability to grab the corner of a square, and you are after able to, to rotate and to, to use it like, a, like you, it was a workstation. The concept, it is a concept of shared object holograms, and you have bilateral interaction on the virtual screen. It is a replication of the main screen and the virtual 3D, as you've seen. For example, here on the bottom right, you have the proctor is able to point in the replication of your large display uh, with the arrowhead, the thing you want to point. And you can do quite exactly the same with the 3D. The proctor has the 3D, he has the ability to rotate, to point, and you will see uh, the red arrow uh, just pointing you, the aneurysm, the neck, the branches, and also the, uh, a yellow ring if you want to talk about um, the distal and proximal landing zone for a stand, for example. Here, the interface uh, of the proctor with a replication of the large display, the 3D, and is able to see what the, the, the physician is seeing. Also, you have a chat and the ability to uh, add images uh, to, for the procedure. I hope in the near future we will be able to integrate artificial intelligence tools to this ecosystem to help the, the physician to make the better choice. Um, for example, um, maybe we will be one day um, able to uh, use uh, the, to increase the physician confidence by adding useful sizing tools for live support, for example, like Siemens Curie One. I also hope something quite different that in the near future we will be able to help and more often low and middle income country uh, to be able to contact with them more often as they did in, um, in surgery in, in many fields uh, uh, as, as published. 
Another way to go maybe in the future is that part of the solution could be used for remote intervention using robots. You can see this very uh, recent article about a remote uh, robotic endovascular thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke. And you can see a lot of similarities between the cockpit of the interventional neuroradiologist and the remote proctoring solution, explaining the part that in this case you have the remote control, of course, of the arm of the robot. The limitation to improve as the Wi-Fi can be poor or absent in Angel Suite, and I hope future Angel Suite will need better connectivity in co cooperation with IT. Some of the systems are fully independent of the urgent suite, are the skill systems, um, and I think it's a great advantage, but some need to be plugged uh, to the screen, and sometimes it's not so easy. Headset and glasses like HoloLens can have issue with a short battery life. In case of a fixed camera, the operator can mask a part of the screen and the proctor can be in the dark for a moment. And in conclusion, a solution of remote proctory are available and a significant number of cases have been performed using especially the skill assist system. Uh, to my point of view, advantage are real in terms of ecologic, less time consuming, possibly more interaction with peer, but their use must not limit, and I think it's an important point, uh, necessarily the physical uh, collaboration. A remote proctoring solution will improve and integrate tool for bilateral interaction, and in the future, integration of artificial intelligence tool could improve the care we are going to deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Any questions? No, no questions. I think uh, a great presentation. Thank you very much, Thank Jean-Christophe. You. I have a, just a sorry. short comment, I'm sorry. Go Is ahead. that possible? Please, yeah. Uh, everybody knowing me, they know that I love the uh, human relationships. And uh, I truly believe that uh, we'll continue to have uh, this kind of relationship. I also uh, truly know that this kind of tool is a fantastic tool. And uh, uh, Carol Fab from uh, Striker was the origin of the development of the skill assist. So we were uh, talking together the way uh, she could develop her ID. And she finally came at Striker to develop a tool with it fantastic. It's fantastic because it's very simple. You can set up that in every uh, single cat lab and you can uh, set up in a very easy way, either in the cat lab or for the physician. So I agree with you, Jean Christophe, it's something which is very easy to use and for sure it will develop over a year. So I uh, truly hope that uh, Striker will continue because this is probably, in my opinion, the best system for uh, remote proctoring. Regarding the other system you were speaking about, it looks like a little bit to the system which is uh, currently developed by Philips for the, for the visualization in the Angel Suite. So it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see how it can be adapted for remote proctoring. It's probably also something which is very uh, promising. Two different technology, yeah. two different way of thinking. Uh, probably the second one will be a little bit more difficult to set up, maybe, I don't know. But it will bring something which is a virtual reality, which is for sure something very interesting. Yeah, I agree. And the only drawback or limitation is the connectivity. But maybe with 5G in the future, that will improve. Um, otherwise, I tried it. It's a very, very good system. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Thank you. And that wraps up the Striker Symposium for today. Over to you.